Mars is quite famously the red planet and its red colour has long been thought to be due to something known as hematite, a type of iron oxide, i.e. plain old rust. That's what we've always been taught. Hematite is a really common mineral on Mars, it's been found all over the place, it explains the red colour, it makes sense. But this month, a paper published by Valentinus and collaborators claimed that it's fairy hydrite that causes Mars' red colour instead. A different type of iron oxide, one with water, H2O, in its chemical makeup. Once again, adding to the mounting pile of evidence that Mars, in the past, may have had a lot of water and have looked a lot more like Earth than the dry desert world that we know and love today. So in this video, we're going to dive in and chat first about why people thought hematite was responsible for the red colour of Mars these past few decades, second, what Valentinus and collaborators have found in their study, and third, what this means for how Mars might have evolved. Because unlike Earth, Mars doesn't have a magnetic field to protect itself from the high energy radiation from the sun. It gets bombarded, just like your computer does by hackers on a public Wi-Fi network. But luckily, you can protect yourself online thanks to Surfshark, who are the sponsor of this week's video. Surfshark is a VPN, it's a virtual private network, and it's essentially like a middleman between your computer and the scary internet, which means your private information, your location and what you're doing is all hidden from anybody who happens to be snooping. Surfshark is crucial for me as an academic because I'm always working on public Wi-Fi networks, whether that's in my office, in the university library, or when travelling for work. It means that no one can snoop on either my unreleased research paper or my credit card information. Plus, Surfshark helps you get the best price when online shopping. So websites usually show you prices based on your location, especially when it comes to things like flight prices. Surfshark helps you get the best deals, which means I can make the most out of my very small research travel budget. Plus, Surfshark even has an antivirus software that shields your devices from viruses, malware, and ad tracking. Look, there's no risk in trying out Surfshark because they offer a 30-day money-back guarantee. And if you head to surfshark.com forward slash Dr. Becky, that link is in the video description down below as well, or use the promo code Dr. Becky, you'll get an additional four months free on your subscription, which is an incredible deal for you all. So thanks again to Surfshark for sponsoring this video and for protecting us all from the scary internet like the Earth's magnetic field does from the scary high energy radiation from the sun. Which brings me back to Mars. So let's chat about why people thought hematite was responsible for Mars's red colour for the past few decades. Now scientists have been speculating about Mars's red colour for centuries, and while the data collected with ground-based telescopes can tell you a lot, there's nothing that compares to actually sending a probe to a planet. The very first satellite in orbit around Mars was actually the first human-made object to orbit another planet, and that was the Mariner 9 orbiter, which arrived at Mars in 1971. And at first, it couldn't actually get the images of the Martian surface that people sent it there to get, because there was a huge planet-wide dust storm that blocked the view. But at least that then could explain Mars's global red colour, because these dust storms distribute it evenly across the whole planet. Then the first lander on Mars was Viking 1 in 1976, and on board it had an instrument which could get a spectrum of light that was reflected off the surface of Mars. A spectrum is where you split the light into like a rainbow, so you get a trace of how much light of each colour or each wavelength you receive. Specific minerals on the surface of Mars actually absorb some specific colours or wavelengths of sunlight and they leave an imprint on the light that's reflected on the surface so that we know that those molecules, those minerals are there. And it was in this kind of data that the Viking 1 team confirmed they had detected lots of iron on the surface of Mars. So people started to speculate, okay, well if there's lots of iron, could it be that the red colour is due to iron oxide, i.e. good old fashioned rust. Basically, iron oxide means a molecule that contains iron and oxygen, and people weren't entirely sure which, like, 
flavour of iron oxide was actually responsible for this red colour. But then the Mars Global Surveyor Satellite in the late 90s and early 2000s identified an iron oxide molecule known as hematite on Mars's surface. Fe2O3, a result that was then confirmed by the Opportunity rover when it landed on Mars in 2004 and found a very hematite rich surface, along with a load of hematite rich spherical, like almost concrete like balls that the team nicknamed blueberries because they looked almost blue next to the red of the dusty surface of Mars. Because this form of crystal hematite, this iron oxide, was grey and not red. Plus to form these little blueberry shaped rocks, there has to have been flowing water on the surface of Mars for it to have naturally formed this way. That's despite the fact that hematite is a dry molecule, it doesn't have any water in it. So this is where the confusion starts. Because for the surface of Mars to be globally covered in a fine dust of red hematite, you need like a continuous oxidization of the iron, plus you then need weathering to break down the clumps into this really fine dust, and you need that to occur in a really dry environment over a long period of time. We're talking billions of years. And yet at the same time you need water and wet conditions to form the blueberries of that crystalline grey hematite. So even back then there was starting to be a lot of doubt in people's minds about whether it was actually hematite that was responsible for the global red colour of Mars. And people started to speculate about whether it could be another iron oxide that was responsible, one that actually did form under wetter conditions. Which brings me to what Valentinas and collaborators have found in their study. So they worked with data from a couple of different Mars orbiters and probes, including the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, MRO, and Mars Express, and ExoMars, all of which gather this spectroscopic data where you're taking that reflected light off the surface and working out what like wavelengths or colors of light are missing to tell you that there are certain molecules or minerals or certain iron oxides that are present on the surface of Mars. And it was using an instrument on board ExoMars that gave the first hints that an iron oxide known as ferrihydrite might be responsible. That's Fe508, some amount of H, and then H2O, i.e. water, an iron oxide that forms under wet conditions. And so what Valentinus and collaborators then did was go to their lab to try and make a mix of minerals, including ferrihydrite, that could recreate that dusty Martian surface. They then observed that sort of Martian analog dust that they created in the lab in the same way that an orbiter or a lander on Mars would do, and try to find like the best match, the best mix of very hydrite with things like basalt that they could that would match the observations that were taken of Mars. And they found that a one to two ratio mix of very hydrite and basalt reproduces the data really well, much better than a similar mix with hematite or other iron oxides. So if the Martian dust really is made of ferrihydrite, a wet iron oxide, rather than hematite, a dry iron oxide, what does this mean for how Mars has evolved? So as you can probably guess, unlike hematite, which forms in very warm, dry conditions, Ferrihydrite needs cool running water to form. We see this on Earth as well. So the two examples Valentinus and collaborators give are a lava cave floor in the Azores in Portugal where iron rich water was dripping from the ceiling and depositing it on the ground to form this reddish ferrihydrite. And the second example they give is a stream in Block Island in the USA where you can see that reddish mineral is forming where the water is running through and it's not forming on the drier rocks around it. So if the majority of Martian dust is actually made from ferrihydrite, that is yet another piece of evidence we can add to the growing pile that Mars looked very different in the past, with liquid water flowing on its surface. Now this is not as crazy as it might sound. We've had hints of this from images taken by Martian orbiters that show features that are similar to like river deltas and lake beds. The Perseverance rover, for example, has been exploring such a region and taking samples from there as well. Obviously this idea of liquid water once flowing on Mars then gets people excited about the idea of did life exist on Mars in the past? We're not talking about today, we're talking about past life on Mars because we know that life on Earth, like all life on Earth needs water to survive. But then another thing you have to consider is that 
if the Martian surface is all of this very hydrite, it didn't just need water to form, it also needed a really big source of oxygen as well. Whether that was in the atmosphere of Mars, it might have been thicker back then, or maybe another source, we just don't know. But it definitely paints a picture of Mars that's very different to what we see today, one that was maybe more Earth-like at the start, but because of Mars's lack of magnetic field, had no defense against the bombardment of radiation from the sun, which stripped that atmosphere away, reducing the temperature and the pressure so that water could no longer remain on the surface of Mars. But this is all just hypothesis for now. What we really need is a sample of the Martian dust. Now people have tried to do this before with Martian meteorites, or lumps of rocks that have fallen to Earth that we know have come from Mars, either because an asteroid slammed into Mars, which threw off a load of chunks that eventually made it to Earth. The problem is, with that chunk of Mars, you know, like, going through space, that changes the chemistry that's going on, and then of course, when it gets into Earth's atmosphere and hits Earth's surface, it then becomes contaminated by all of the Earth chemistry that's going on as well. So there's been no definitive answers about that there. So thankfully, the Perseverance rover is going around collecting samples of the Martian surface, which the plan is for the Mars sample return mission to eventually return to Earth in the future. And I am gonna do my usual plea here to anyone from ESA that might be watching that we should definitely call the Mars sample return mission Rendezvous so that we can nickname it Ron, like we nicknamed Perseverance, Percy, and Ingenuity, Ginny, and then we'll have had three Weasleys on the surface of Mars. Anyway, with those samples that Ron, or MRS, will eventually return, we'll then finally be able to test, you know, how much iron and oxygen and hydrogen do you actually have, you know, on the Martian surface? And is the Martian dust made of very hydrite? Or is it made of hematite? And then either way, say for definite whether there actually once was liquid water flowing on the surface of Mars. And then tried to match, okay, and fine, like the um, there's some form of plane or helicopter or something going overhead. I don't think anyone will be able to hear it. I can't tell if it's getting closer. It is getting closer and it's getting louder. It mustn't be going directly overhead though. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, how are you still going over? It must be going like, I don't know, like really, like not straight over, but like near, but like parallel to the house or something. <laughs> <laughs>